dear honorary rector, dear colleagues and students, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to see that so many people in this town are fascinated by fundamental science. And this evening we will enter the world of string theory. The occasion is an international conference that takes place in Leuven this week. In fact, 20 years ago, the European networks had just started and the theoretical physics groups in Leuven uh, was among the first to take the initiative to start a European funded collaboration. And in this context, in 1995, a workshop in Leuven was started and it also initiated a series that continues on a yearly basis in different universities in Europe. Leuven has coordinated three consecutive four-year EC networks sponsoring these workshops. But while in the EC, in the meantime, has terminated its support to Marie Curie networks for pure fundamental science, our collaboration of European universities continues and we keep organizing these events with the help of diverse funding, including at the moment a cost action. And this year we are happy to have the European workshop back in Leuven discussing the string theory universe. In the margin of this workshop, which takes place during the full week in the campus, campus Arenberg, uh, Thomas Hertog and Erik Verlinde tonight will give an introduction to the string theory universe for the general public. The two talks are connected and questions will be postponed until after the both talks. But let me first present the two speakers. Erik Verlinde and his identical twin brother Herman were students of Nobel laureate Gerard Hooft in Utrecht. They were immediately attracted to string theory and worked also under the supervision of Professor Bernard de Witt, a leading scientist in supergravity related to string theory. When the Verlinde twins started publishing in 1987, they immediately impressed the string theory community. Later they went each their own way and uh, Eric has been staff member in Princeton and CERN and is now professor at the University of Amsterdam. His work was often related to string theory and string theorists now work with concepts like the Verlinde algebra, the Verlinde formula, the uh, witten dijkraaf verlinde verlinde equation and so on. In 2009, Eric also introduced the concept of entropic gravity, where gravity originates from differences in density of information in different locations. It started also discussions on thermodynamic properties of gravity. In 2011, Eric Verlinde received the Spinoza Prize, the highest scientific award in the Netherlands. Thomas Hertog is already well known in Flanders. After his master studies, licentiaat at the time, in Leuven, he became PhD student of Stephen Hawking in Cambridge. One of his early famous papers in 2000 was called Brain New World, where he already combined inflation, the inflation idea of cosmology with extensions of string theory, with our, which are the brains. After having been working in California, Santa Barbara, in CERN and in Parisette, he came back to Leuven as professor in 2011. Thanks to him, we could enjoy a mass event with Stephen Hawking right in this room and in the park nearby. Meanwhile, Thomas has continued to work, often with Stephen, on cosmological inflation and the wave function of the universe. 
Thomas is well known for his very accessible explanations of physical concepts, and I hope you will enjoy his talk that will open this evening. Thank you, Tuan. It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, speak here tonight, if I get this thing going. Um, I'll do my best to set the scene for Eric later on, and maybe I even say something you might agree with. Um, but scientific honesty, so the string theory universe, scientific honesty obliges me to uh, first set the scene a little bit to give you a feel for what you got yourself into tonight. Is string theory, what is the state of string theory? Is string theory completed? Is it published, patented, written up? Well, no, by no means. Is it ever going to be completed? I'm not sure. It feels a little bit like the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Beautiful and permanently under construction. Has it been tested? Well, no, it hasn't been completed, so it can't have been tested. Is there any experimental support for string theory? Well, there might be. But we haven't really understood it. But I think there might be. Is it just wild speculation? Ah, no, by no means. It's a branch of science. It's theoretical physics, the same branch of theoretical physics that Francois Angler was working in when he predicted his boson in 64. It's real science. Is it exciting? Yes, it's extremely exciting. And that's what I'm going to tell you all about it tonight. The basic idea of string theory, it's an approach to realize Einstein's dream of unified theory of physics, a framework that unites all forces that are at work in our universe. And the original idea, which goes back nearly 40 years now, is really straightforward. String the according to string theory, if you take any piece of matter, like a flower, and if you were to examine it at ever finer scales, at first you would find molecules and atoms, then you would find subatomic particles, but eventually, according to string theory, on scales that we can't probe yet um, experimentally, you'd find something else. You'd find little, tiny strips tiny filaments of energy, little vibrating strings deep hidden inside any piece of matter. And these strings vibrate. And just like these strings on a violin, where different vibrations, different patterns of vibrations produce different musical notes, according to string theory, the different vibrations of those strings produce different particles, different forces. So electrons, photons, quarks, neutrinos, all the particles, according to string theory, arise from different vibrations of a single string. So this is an elegant unification. It's as this string theory describes, so to speak, a kind of cosmic symphony where all the diversity and the richness in our world emerges from vibrating strings. But this unification comes at a cost. The mathematics of string theory only works if you allow for something really special, extra dimensions of space. We're all familiar with the usual three dimensions of space, up and down, left and right, back and forward. But according to string theory, if you were to examine space at a really extremely fine-grained level, point by point, as it were, you would find additional dimensions. And those additional dimensions are needed in order for string theory, in order for the mathematics of string theory to actually work out and be consistent. And the shape of those, extra, of those additional dimensions, so these additional dimensions are curled up 
to a tiny size, so, which is why we haven't seen them. So they're hidden from us, but they have an impact on what we observe. Because the shape, the geometry of those dimensions constrains how these strings can vibrate. And because different vibrations of the strings determine the masses and the kinds of particles and the kinds of forces in our world, it means really that the shape of the additional dimensions determines physics as we know it. In other words, if you were to know the shape of the hidden dimensions of string theory, you would be able to predict what kind of particles, what kind of physics, what kind of chemistry there is. But we don't know the shape. The mathematics of string theory does not select a unique shape, a unique geometry for the additional dimensions. Rather, it allows for a wide range of shapes of hidden dimensions, each corresponding to its own um, ensemble of particles, its own world, so to speak. So some people have argued, well, this means that this is the end of string theory. This means the theory uh, doesn't make testable, verifiable, concrete predictions. Other people have turned this on issue on its head and have argued, well, what, really, what string theory really describes is a multiverse, a collection of worlds, each with its own laws of physics, each corresponding to the shapes, the different shapes of the hidden dimensions. So in that story that I just told you, what is the essence of string theory? What's the heart of string theory? Is it the theory of vibrating strings? A unifying framework? theory of extra dimensions of space, or a multiverse. Well, there's one thing that Eric and I do agree on. Probably, it's none of the above. There's a more profound way of looking at string theory, and that's the story we want to tell you tonight. All these features are extremely interesting and they're probably pieces of the puzzle, but there's something more going on, which is what's getting us really into an exciting, revolutionary era in science. And to appreciate that story, I'll have you to take you back, back for a moment, all the way to the 17th century, when Newton formulated this theory of gravity. Newton's insight was that a force that pulls apples to the ground and the force that makes planets move around the sun or the moon around the earth, that is actually the same force and he called this gravity. Now that unification of the celestial, so to speak, and the terrestrial was a marvelous unification of our picture of nature at the time. It was a beautiful, the fact that the same force governs motions on Earth and up in the sky was, at the time, a truly revolutionary idea. Newton's law of gravity was, it has also been extremely successful. It's all you need to get to the moon, for instance. But Newton realized that at the same time, his law of gravity opens up a profound mystery which he was never able to solve. Here in a letter to his friend Richard Bentley, he writes, gravity must be caused by an agent. But whether that agent is material or immaterial is a question I have left to the consideration of my readers. Think about 
the moon and the earth. How does the moon know about the earth? What keeps it in orbit? What mediates the force of gravity? This is a mystery that is unsolved uh, in Newton's theory. And it sharpened over the years, certainly towards the end of the 19th century. And it wasn't until Einstein wrote down his equations, his new theory of gravity, not on this poster, of course, when he wrote it down that he solved the mystery of that Newton had left us with. Einstein's answer to what gravity's agent was was truly ingenious. Einstein said, well, it's the fabric of space and time itself. You know, in Newton's gravity, in Newton's worldview, space is just out there. And time, well, time just goes on. They're absolute, they're separate, they're just sitting there like an arena, not participating in anything uh, in the dynamics of the world. But Einstein's theory creates a dialogue between matter on the one hand and the fabric of space and time on the other hand. And it's that dialogue which in Einstein's theory creates gravity or creates what we perceive as gravity. Now here is Einstein's theory. You see it's short. When you go for a beer later on, you can write it down on a little piece of paper, if you remember it. And it's an equation, and the equation in mathematics, the dialogue in mathematics is an equation. When you change something on one side, it has an impact on the other side and vice versa. On the right-hand side here, there stands all you need to know about the matter. On the left-hand side of the equation, there's an object that represents the geometry of space and time. Now, I've cheated a little bit here. There's a really, these are 10 equations, but in mathematics, we're good at condensing those so that it looks like a single equation. These Greek letters mu and u, they can take four values. They're matrices, so to speak. Why four? Three space dimensions in Einstein's theory and one time dimension. They're interwoven with each other, and together they form the fabric of space-time. And here is how it works in pictures. So imagine now just like a sheet, a two-dimensional sheet of space. Say, the plane in which all planets move around the sun. Then according to Einstein's theory, a heavy mass like the sun will bend that sheet of space. It will create a valley, as it were. And the heavier the object, the more pronounced the bending of space of the fabric of space will be. Now imagine you take a lighter object, like a planet, in that space, create that valley created by the sun. Just like that, the planet will move around the sun. The planet will move on a simple straight trajectory in a curved space background created by the sun. So gravity, in Einstein's theory, is very much a manifestation of the structure of the shape of space. So that was 1915. And Einstein's theory was quickly tested. The fact that space-time is bent means that pretty much everything that you send in, including light, will be following curved trajectories. Indeed, you might have seen this in Interstellar, that's now they realized in Hollywood as well that space-time is curved. And that curvature, the effect of that curvature on the motion of light, is precisely what was used in the very first test 
of Einstein's theory of relativity. In 1919, Arthur Reddington, a British astronomer, realized this and went to Africa to look at a solar eclipse. And what he saw during that solar eclipse, right next to the sun, he saw the starlights, he saw the images of stars which he knew in reality found themselves behind the sun at that point. The reason he saw those images next to the sun, just to the right or the left of it, was that the starlight was bent by the space valley created by the sun's way. So this is all the world needed at that point. A British astronomer testing a German's theory in 1919, a beautiful confirmation of science, one of the most beautiful theories ever designed. Now, so you would think Einstein was really happy, although it doesn't really show from this picture, but in any case, when his theory got on the ray, he set out for the very first time in mankind to apply the whole thing to the entire universe, the entirety of space. You put all the matter on the left-hand side of the equation, and what comes out? And in fact, it didn't quite work. He had a very hard time getting a universe which would just stand still. He could, universe, he could get universes which contract or universes which expand, but he started fiddling with his equations to really try to get the universe to stand still. Because he thought the universe should be static. That's too bad, really. Um, he failed to predict the expansion of the universe. He failed to make a prediction. Could have been famous. <laughs> but in the end, it was um, Georges Lemaitre, a Leuven scientist, who really understood the depth of the implications of Einstein's theory for cosmology, for the evolution of the entire universe. And here is a sketch made by uh, Lemaitre, the very first sketch ever made in 1927, here just around the corner, of a universe in evolution, a dynamical universe. What you see here on the horizontal axis is time, and on the vertical axis, um, something measuring the expansion. These are solutions of Einstein's theory, solved by Lemaitre in the late 20s, for a variety of different universes, hence the different curves. Depending on what he put in, in his universe, he got out a different evolution. Now, what does an expanding universe mean? Right? I mean, lots of things are mind-boggling in cosmology, distances and all that, but you should be even more boggled by the notion of an expanding universe. It doesn't mean expanding in some bigger space because the universe is all space. It's the entirety. So really what it means in fairly pragmatic terms is that the distance between galaxies, between different galaxies, is increasing because space is stretching as time goes on. Now, there are various options. Space can be stretching, and then, uh, depending on the matter in the universe, it can either recollapse or expand, whatever. So here's an example. Uh, here's just an example, an illustration of one of these curves in which galaxies initially recede from each other, and then eventually there turns out to be enough matter in this universe that start contracting again, and at this point you really need to get worried, because the whole thing contracts into what became known as Big Crunch. This was 1927. Early confirmation of Lemaitre's ideas came very quickly. It came in 1929, 
with the observations of the American astronomer Edwin Hubble, who had a new, really heavy, big telescope near Pasadena, with which he determined that the nebulae, the clouds, which had been seen since medieval times on the sky, these clouds, little clouds on the sky, were in fact distant, independent galaxies. They were not part of our Milky Way. These clouds, which had been known on, to exist for a long time, were collections, huge collections of stars themselves, independent galaxies, and Hubble determined that indeed those galaxies, those distant galaxies on average, are moving away from us, confirming Lemaitre's idea that our universe is expanding, our universe is in evolution. And gradually the picture was refined. By observing throughout the 20th century, a wide range of observations seemed to build more and more evidence for Lemaitre's evolving universe, Lemaitre's Big Bang model, as it became known. And in the end, the consensus is that it's about 13.7 year, billion years since the Big Bang, and that our universe has a kind of funny history. It expands rapidly at first, then it slows down what Lemaitre called the hesitating universe. And now, well now, since a few billion years, it seems to be expanding again in a more rapid, uh, rapid, in an accelerating way, the expansion seems to speed up. That means, if that continues, by the way, that the end of our universe, the far future of our universe, is very bleak. All galaxies in a few billion years will just have gone out of sight. No cosmology anymore. I've been telling this to the funding agencies. We should fund no, this is the time to do cosmology. It hasn't worked so far. So, but this acceleration is a little strange, and I, I, I bet Eric will return to this. This acceleration means that something, some matter, remember Einstein's equation, evolution of the space-time, something, some matter, some form of matter must be driving it, and we don't really know what it is, what it is. and so it's being called a dark energy, a sort of pervading mist in space which uh, speeds up the acceleration, which has a repulsive gravity. Now, we can't see all the way back to the beginning. As you can imagine, when the universe, when you trace the evolution of an expanding universe back in time, it shrinks, it gets hotter, at some point it gets really hot, and it becomes like one giant fireball through which you can you cannot see, just like you can't see inside the surface of the, in, inside inside the, the sun. And the limit is indicated here. That is kind of a moment, a defining moment in the universe's history, about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. It's the moment when the universe finally became transparent when photons, light particles, were able to travel freely. Those particles have been traveling freely ever since, so we can take a picture of that moment. This is it. It's a very fine picture. And you see this firewall is flickering. Some regions are a little hotter than other regions, just a little bit. Those flickers are extremely important in cosmology because without them, nothing would ever happen. It's those flickers, those little hot and cold regions, which gradually, over the course of many million and even billion years, condensed under the force of gra and under their own gravitational attraction, into the structures that we see later on in the universe, galaxies, stars, and so forth. Now you're going to ask, well, where are those flickers coming from? Oh, we can't see further. But just like if you were to sit at some campfire and you were in a scientific mood, 
and you were to analyze the, cam the fire in great detail, you could probably figure out what was burning. Well, cosmologists, they do the same. We've analyzed those flickers at depth in order to learn something about yet earlier epochs in the history of the universe. And I wouldn't say there's a consensus, but there's strong evidence that these flickers arose from what's written here, what we've called a period of inflation, a very early period, the first fraction of a second after the Big Bang of extremely rapid expansion. If a universe expands extremely rapidly, space-time tends to vibrate, and that causes those, that causes naturally this kind of pattern of flickers. So it's a beautiful story. It's unifying 13.7 billion years of evolution, all in one picture, and we understand pretty much how it all works. It goes from a fireball with some flickers, 13 billion years later, to an interesting universe with dinosaurs, stromae, string conferences, all sorts of things. Yet there is a catch. There's a major catch to this story. And that's what's gonna get us to the heart of string theory. And the catch is all the way at the beginning the Big Bang itself. It wasn't a bang. There was no explosion. In fact, there was no space. There was no time. The Big Bang in Einstein's theory of relativity is really where the notions of space and time itself, the fabric of space-time, melts, as it were, disintegrates. It's what we call a space-time singularity. And that doesn't sound very good for the theory. Well, it isn't very good for the theory. The theory, Einstein's theory, really breaks down. Now you could say, well, does it really matter? The Big Bang is a long time ago. Uh, surely we're OK. The point is some details do matter. And this is one of these details that really does matter. And I like the way Paul Davies formulated this about 10 years ago. He wrote in one of his 65 books, the emergence of life in our universe depends delicately on a number of seemingly fortuitous features of the physical conditions at the Big Bang. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm just going to give one example of what he means. Well, okay. Fundamentally, it means that if the Big Bang were a little different, if our universe got going in a little bit different way, it just would have gone completely wrong from our viewpoint, i.e., we wouldn't have existed. One example of this is that dark energy that I mentioned before, that mysterious, pervasive, mist in space, which seems to be driving, which seems to be accelerating the expansion. Why does it show up after 13 billion years? The answer, remember Einstein's equation, space-time matter, the answer is that the amount of dark energy is exceedingly small, absurdly small. It's a zero Hey, there, there's a one hole the way at the end. Huh? It's extremely, extremely small in the natural units that you would expect it. And if it had been a little larger, if there had been one or two zeros less, it just would never have worked, our universe. The acceleration would have set in after a billion years, long before the solar system, in fact, existed. And never would there have been any galaxies or structure or string theory conferences and whatsoever. So, it seems 
as if a hidden hand operating at the Big Bang set our universe going in the right, in just the right way. In other words, it appears that the deepest secrets of the evolution of our universe and of our existence in it lies all the way at the Big Bang, that little detail where relativity doesn't apply. The same occurs in black holes, by the way, as Eric will discuss in more detail. Space time, curvature, the valley increases, becomes stronger when you take a more massive object and when you exaggerate space time the fabric of space-time really cracks. Well, that's a black hole. It's a crack in space-time. And in fact, some of you might have seen this movie. This is just what they're talking about here. If you were to hear it. Uh, the sound doesn't come through. Anyway, so this is Stephen Hawking defending his PhD thesis, his doctoral thesis. In Hawking's doctoral thesis, his main result was to prove that the space-time singularity at the Big Bang is unavoidable. A baby version of this proof, incidentally, was proven by Georges Lemaitre upon request, incidentally, from Einstein. Einstein, in the early 30s, still reluctant to accept the notion of expanding universe, asked Lemaitre, can you really not avoid the beginning? And at that point, Lemaitre proved, in a baby version, that no, it's not possible. And the full, full-fledged proof was given by Hawking uh, and Penrose in, um, in the 60s. So to summarize, where have we gone with our notion of space-time? In Newton's world, space and time are separate and absolute, like in metaphysical arena. Einstein's general theory of relativity changes that, as space and time are interwoven, dynamical, and in fact responsible for what Newton called gravity. But Einstein's theory, if you really think it true, it predicts its own downfall. Space and time tend to be destroyed in what we call space-time singularities. But that means that Einstein didn't really solve Newton's mystery. Newton's agent for gravity, according to Einstein, was space and time. But if space and time tend to be destroyed, they can't be fundamental, so there must be more going on we still haven't gotten to the core of gravity. And this is, at last, where string theory, at its most fundamental level, enters. At its most fundamental level, string theory is a framework for a theory of physics which does not a priori assume space and time exist. And that's what we find so exciting about it, because that's what's needed to understand those deepest secrets at the origin of our universe. It's, in fact, the very first scientific framework that attempts to do that, and where we stand, how that works, what potentially replaces our notions of space and time, Eric will tell more about. I would just like to conclude by showing you one paper, which I find one of the coolest papers of the 20th, scientific papers of the 20th century. It's written in the early 30s by Georges Lemaitre, and it's a paper in which he drives home his point 
that the universe is in evolution. It's a short paper without any equation, published in Nature, nicely signed Rue de Namur à Louvain, in which he sets out his vision that the origin of our universe should be part of science. It's the very first paper in modern cosmology in which this proposal was made, in which the statement was made that also the origin of our universe should be understandable. And you see his vision, Lemaitre, Lemaitre called that origin not a Big Bang, but he called that a primeval atom. And his vision was, as you can read, that space and time would altogether fail to have any meaning. So his vision was really as something that goes beyond Einstein's theory. But Lemaitre never wrote down a single equation describing his primeval atom. The time was not ripe. The tools, the mathematical tools, weren't there. But the paper shows that string theory isn't just our problem. This is really about a dialogue over many generations. It's a quest, mankind's quest, which spans generations and generations and which unites people from all over the world. People from Iran and Israel and Europe and the States. And that's also what makes this so special. Thank you. Maar ik hoor mijzelf niet. Hoor ik, word ik, zit ik erop of niet? Hoor je mij? Ook met de microfoon? Oké, okay, prima. Even kijken of deze werkt. Ja, um, yeah, all right. Well, it's a pleasure. Kijk, doe maar hier. Even kijken hoor. Doe maar. Nu. Wat gebeurt hier? It's a pleasure to be here and uh, indeed, uh, well, I think it's an exciting time and an exciting story that Thomas has just started to tell you and that we are experiencing as string theorists. String theory has been around for 40 years and I think myself, I've worked for more than 25 years on it and uh, gradually we are starting to understand that we are changing the way we think about physics and quite profoundly. String theory, in my view, I mean, when we think about what it has started from uh, as a, indeed a way of describing elementary particles as vibrating strings has now developed in a much wider set of mathematical ideas and it goes towards what is space-time, what is gravity and it's going to change how we think about gravity in, a, in I think a different way than even string theorists uh, are realizing and eventually I think it will change also cosmology. I don't think we're there yet and it's one of those things we're discussing at these conferences is, well, how do we learn from string theory? How can we describe these questions uh, about the early universe of how the universe actually came to be as it is today? But I'll also go back actually to, to remind you a little bit of what was necessary or what was the key ideas, why did Newton have to change his equation, or why did Einstein write on new, new equations? Uh, Newton's theory worked very well, except there was a tiny thing that didn't work. Uh, if you look at the orbit of Mercury around the Sun, it had these funny um, orbits that don't fully um, go back to themselves. Uh, namely, the, the orbit rotates and it shifts what's called the perihelion. That's the, the nearest point near the sun. 
And this can be beautifully explained by Einstein's theory, but there's another way to explain this. Namely, you can ex uh, think about an extra planet near the sun, which was called Vulcan, uh, which would also explain the same orbits. And indeed, people started looking for it to explain uh, that, that indeed these funny orbits would be there. And now we laugh about this because we know that this, of course, is explained by Newton's, for Einstein's general relativity. Indeed, in general relativity, the orbits of planets are not exactly closed. They do these funny loops exactly as uh, what is observed in near Mercury. But also, Einstein's theory has not always worked perfectly. I mean, of course, it predicts very well how light behaves near near heavy objects. We see the bending of light exactly like uh, Eddington observed that indeed another star is seen at another position, sorry, the star is seen as another position than where it really is, and that's because light is bent by space, the curvature of space and time. And this has been seen in many ways. You can see it in, uh, well, looking at objects in the sky, you can see rings appearing, which come from the fact that uh, light bends around a mass that we see here, and we can even determine how much mass is necessary to make the light go around. So this is even a way of determining how much light is, uh, ma mass is inside here by looking at the way the light is bent around. And we can do this even for larger objects. This is a picture of the Hubble telescope where we see beautiful rings which are due to the fact that the light from a so far away galaxy is curved around in this cluster of galaxies and there must be a lot of matter in here, none of which that we can see, but it has to be there, otherwise we cannot explain how the light is curved. So this is evidence for matter that we cannot see, and we believe there must be dark matter. But in a way, this story is not very different from trying to explain the orbit of Mercury by assuming extra matter. Here we do even much more. We assume that there must be much more matter to explain and make uh, Einstein's theory work. So you might say uh, Einstein's theory works very well, but in order to explain indeed what we see on Earth, the light matter that we see here is then not everything. There must be a lot of dark matter in these clusters, but also in galaxies. Uh, to say, say this a little more clearly, in galaxies the observations are very easy to make, just like what we see with rotations of planets around the Sun. We can study the rotations of stars in galaxies so here's a galaxy, which here is the center, and then we measure the velocity as a function of the distance. Normally in Newtonian gravity or even Einstein gravity, you would expect that when you have all of most of the matter in the center, that the velocity would diminish when you go further out. This, for instance, is how it, uh, the velocities behave in, in the solar system. Indeed, it goes down when you go further out. This is therefore what's expected from theory, but this is what's being observed. So it turns out that the velocities are much higher than not what we expect based on the theory of uh, Einstein or, 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 or Newton. Again, we have to assume more matter to explain why these velocities are so high in order to keep the stars not from flying away. This is called dark matter. And indeed, the current theory of cosmology assumes extra matter to be there, extra dark energy to be there, and we think indeed that, well, if we want to explain it with current physics, this extra matter that's there should form a halo consisting of some unknown particles that we haven't seen yet. And it's not just a little bit. It's not a tiny planet that we have to add. No, we have to have, if you look at the amount of matter in, the, in a galaxy, about 30 times more. Most physicists actually don't even know that this is such a large number. For, the, for our galaxy, we need 30 times more matter than we can see to explain how these rotation curves behave. That's a big problem. And indeed, I think that the explanation that, that some particle may not be the only explanation, and we need to gonna tell you maybe there are another way we have to think about gravity. But dark matter, as I said, makes a fundamental, is a fundamental part of our, our uh, current understanding of the universe. Uh, if we make our cosmological models work, we have to assume that there's more matter than we can see. Even in these clusters, there's another way of, of seeing it. There are ways of making uh, observations, again using lensing, where the matter that we see is um, the red one, that's the red, we call it red, 
but the matter that we don't see, but we can deduce from the way that the light bands is blue, and you see there's a lot of blue around the red, and here it's even in different locations, and this is seen as evidence again for this dark matter. So our cosmological scenario, or a cosmological description of, of the universe involves a lot of extra stuff. What we see, ordinary matter, is less than 5%. The dark matter is 20, about 25%, so six time, five times more than the ordinary matter. And then there's 70% of dark energy, and we have no idea what this is. So 95% of the energy of the universe is simply assumed and added there in order to make Einstein's theory work. And to me, this is a big fix uh, for the theory. So maybe something else is going on. This is from an observational side. From a theoretical side, there are other indications why Einstein's theory may eventually be replaced by something else. And for that, I will go back to the other uh, thing that was introduced, the other elements in gravity where gravity comes most strong. Uh, this is black holes. So we heard already a little bit about black holes. So black holes are objects where the matter uh, is concentrated so much that uh, the gravity is so strong that even light cannot escape. So when light cannot escape, there is some imaginary sphere around the matter that if you go beyond that sphere, you cannot escape because even light cannot go away. And we call this the horizon. So the horizon actually is the size of the black hole but the matter itself is actually inside and we cannot see it and even light cannot escape, so no one else can even escape as well. And the size of the horizon depends on the amount of mass, so if you have more mass in the black hole, it even gets bigger. And in terms of Einstein's theory, uh, you can think about the space-time as a need having bent so much that there's something in the side, which is the singularity, but what's more important actually is this horizon. And the horizon you can think about in this picture of curved space-time where, where you have, well, actually here we have suppressed uh, the three dimensions and we sort of represented it by two dimensions, but the curvature can be thought of as some, some throat, and then there's some imaginary sphere around it, which here would be a circle, where you would see the horizon. And indeed, light uh, gets bended here as well, and even time is different. Uh, clocks start moving slowly, and at the horizon, clocks even stop. And light uh, bends around in many, in many ways, actually. It can go around many times, even. Uh, just like this lens effect. And uh, light rays can even be trapped inside the black hole. Now, what I'm going to show you now is what it would look like uh, to be near a black hole. Uh, we already heard about this movie. But this is based on some more scientific uh, calculations. This is the Earth rotating around a black hole. Now, you might say the Earth gets deformed, but that's not really, not really what's going on. The Earth just goes around, but it's the light that we see coming from above and below. It's again this lens effect. I'm going to show you even a movie when you fall into the black hole. But for, in order to ex understand the movie, I'm going to remind you of the fact that indeed objects get bent around, the light gets bent around. So what we are seeing here is a black hole and we're going to fall towards it. And the background will be a galaxy, actually our galaxy. Uh, that's just to see the light coming, but the light gets indeed bended around, and this is the Einstein ring. And here you see a little image which is going to tell you where you are, and we're going to form an orbit going into the black hole, eventually crossing the horizon and going in. And the horizon, I think, is indicated red. Let me start the movie. There's also a clock, actually, on the right-hand side that tells you what, how the time will go. But um, you'll see that that is also uh, dependent on where we are. Let me start it now. Yes, there it goes. So here we are going in, and then we're still safe. This green region is where you can still sort of escape, if you want, even without um, having a, um, a rocket. But here you have to start accelerating if you want to get out. But here we see already the horizon appearing. And eventually we'll drop in. And you see then the horizon. This is what's outside, and this region is sort of the boundary where the horizon is. This is the North Pole and the South Pole, which are bended, and this is where we go through. And eventually, we would hit the singularity, and this is, well, not being computed, but this is what it would look like if you would fall in. 
So it's very exciting to think about black holes, and this is beautifully described by uh, Einstein's general relativity. But theorists are not uh, satisfied yet, and actually they use black holes also as their laboratories to think about. So theorists, they like to ask questions what happens when we do kinds of experiments near these black holes, and especially near the horizon. You might say we have to do experiments near the singularity, but actually the horizon is a much more interesting place to be because you can do things just near it and you can try to get out again. And then it turns out that we don't even understand the laws near the horizon. While the horizon actually looks as a space-time, well, this, this line where the horizon is, so what actually happens here in the picture is that when you send out light, generally light goes in all directions. This is when we have a, a light bulb, we see it going in all directions. But near a black hole, what actually happens is that the light basically gets only emitted inward and cannot escape outward. The colors also change because the clocks go differently. And at the horizon, indeed, everything goes in. And this is sort of depicted here that the light sort of gets emitted all the way in. And this is our, our theorist picture of a black hole. And you then can do thought experiments. And these are done many years ago. And Stephen Hawking, um, Thomas's um, advisor and teacher, he actually was one of the first to think about this, together with another colleague uh, called Beckenstein. Beckenstein and, and Hawking thought about what happens when you throw in boxes with thermal radiation into a black hole and all kinds of other thought experiments in order to sort of determine what really is go on, goes on near those horizons. This is quite a, a challenge and indeed they found surprising results. And it's this particular uh, Hawking, who did the most important calculation, it's actually featured in the movie uh, Theory of Everything, he realized that black holes, even though light cannot escape, they're not totally black. If you take into account quantum mechanics, uh, then there's a possibility that particles, because of the uncertainty principle, get created out of the vacuum, a particle and an antiparticle. And when you take this into account near a uh, horizon, then suddenly what can happen is that normally those particles would actually combine and come back to itself. You have a particle and an antiparticle for a short amount of time and they re-combine. Uh, but near a horizon, one of them can fall into the black hole and the other can escape. And this leads to radiation, particles escaping from the black hole and it even uh, gives the black hole a, a temperature. This was his famous discovery, and it actually changed the way we think about black holes because it made the horizon as a very special region, and it turns out that we can think about horizons as having hot temperature and also all kinds of other thermodynamic properties normally you would associate with a object which has, well, particles in it and does all kinds of things, while here it's space-time itself that carries a temperature and that starts emitting uh, particles, radiation. And indeed, Hawking wrote down a famous formula for the temperature in terms of the acceleration at the horizon. I won't uh, go into the details here. I think this is really the most fundamental discovery that we now think that actually led to a whole discussion and actually is the reason why we believe that Einstein's theory of gravity has to change. And it's a crack in Einstein's theory, and you see the crack is here. It's not down the throat. It's not the singularity, the crack is at the horizon. And it's really where the horizon is as far as we can look into a black hole. It means that light cannot come to us anymore and for us it's the end of space time. There's nothing beyond the horizon that we can see, nothing that we can communicate with. Space time ends at the horizon. And there are all kinds of discussions about it or whether we can still fall in, and even nowadays, in, in the recent months and years, we have had all kinds of discussions near the horizon, and we basically have even forgotten about the fact that there might be a singularity inside. That does not worry us. It's the notion what space-time is, and how we think about space-time that started changing when uh, Hawking wrote down his formula. So I'm going to tell you a very different story about what gravity is about what space-time is and even how we should think about the beginning of uh, space and time. And to think about this, I'd like you first see this picture and ask what is this? You probably don't recognize it, but I'll show you what it is. First of all, I'll make it smaller. That doesn't help very much, but I, now it's part of a bigger picture. 
There it is. Now we see what it is. Of course, this is a mountain and everything we see what it is. But of course it's not, it's just a collection of pixels. But our minds, we make something out of it which we can give a meaning. And so this is what I call emergence. It's the fact that from small objects, which we don't know what it is, if they put them all together, enough of them, we start making a universe that looks like the one we have. So emergence is the idea that we use concepts in order to describe physics which microscopically exist, but microscopically they have no meaning. So even when we talk about space and time, you don't really know what it's made of. And the same is true in, in many parts of physics. Usually we use only uh, the microscopic description and not the microscopic one. An example of emergence in physics is the fact that if we look at a, a room filled with molecules and they do all kinds of things, we don't describe all the motions of those molecules. We only look at the statistical average of over all these microscopic motions. And we define notions like temperature, pressure, and so on. And those are the macroscopic things that we talk about. So many laws of physics are actually emergent because temperature has no microscopic definition. Temperature is just the average of all uh, so a single particle, for instance, has, doesn't have a temperature. It's the average energy per particle, for instance. And there's another notion that we need to introduce, which is called entropy, which I'll explain a little more what it is. If you forget about all the motions of these particles, um, you forget a lot about information, all kinds of possibilities of what they do. And the amount of microscopic possibilities we, we measure by the entropy. So those are thermodynamic notions that I will introduce because they are important for understanding these laws of black holes. In particular, entropy I want to talk about because temperature, we have some idea what this is. So one way to think about entropy is in terms of information. And this is really what the key uh, will be. Information is uh, associated with possibilities. For instance, here's a coin that has two possibilities. And so if I have two coins, then I can have heads or tails and you see there are four possibilities uh, with two coins. If I would have n coins, I would have two to the n possibilities. And this is what we call the number of, uh, well, actually the entropy then, is then the logarithm of that number. So for n coins, that entropy would be equal to n. Possibilities are set like zeros and ones, like in a, in a computer, so we call this the number of bits. This is the definition of Shannon. So, there's some way we can measure the amount of information in terms of the number of bits that we have. Now, going back to black holes, what Hawking showed is that a black hole does not only have a temperature, but also have an, it has an, uh, an entropy. So a black hole has a horizon, and it turns out the amount of information that is hiding, because behind the horizon can throw all kinds of things, uh, it doesn't should tell us what's behind the horizon, so we can only know how much information of how much mass is in there, but also how much information. And this information is measured by an entropy, basically the number of bits, as I said, but it's precisely given by the area of the horizon. The size of the horizon tells us basically how much information is hidden uh, by the black hole. And this is a very fundamental idea that the area is given you this amount of information. And this is our, one of the central ideas and actually one of those formulas of Hawking that has revolutionized our current thinking of, of, uh, of gravity. It led to all kinds of discussions, by the way, because you might ask what happens to this information? Is it lost? Can we retrieve it? And uh, this has been going on for, for 25 or 30, 30 years at least. And uh, Still, we are not totally there yet, but we believe that our answers and string theory actually made here a difference. Uh, also, my thesis advisor, by the way, Gerard Hoofd, who was one of the first to think fundamentally about this question differently than Hawking, he said information cannot be lost, information must be possible to retrieve it. And he also said that this fact that we can store this information on the surface has profound consequences about gravity and also how we should think about our universe. He introduced what's called now the holographic principle. Um, it was also made popular by, by Lenny Susskind, and sort of both of them sort of made this idea, uh, well, realized that uh, at first, and now it's be, been become part of string theory. 
But the idea is the following, that if you think about a part of space or even a part of the universe, you can imagine there's some Im sphere around it. Uh, if we make a black hole with the same size as that sphere, we know how much information is in there. It's uh, the area of that surface, and it's as if you write zeros and ones in natural units on the surface, and this is the amount of information inside. And it's as if all the information that's contained in the inside must be written on the boundary, and this is what we call a hologram, because you have to reconstruct what's inside from the information on the boundary. At the moment that uh, Toft proposed this, this was sort of a little bit of a vague idea, but uh, in the meantime, we have concretely thought about these things in string theory. So let me now bring in string theory again, because for the last 20 minutes, I didn't even talk about string theory. By the way, how much time do I have? Uh, 15 minutes, okay. So co going back to string theory, here I have again this picture of string theory where um, we think about string theory in vibrating strings, but it turns out that when you develop string theory, there are many more things that are going on in, string, uh, in there. There are extra dimensions with curled up uh, space-time, uh, which are the, these manifolds that, that when you curl them up, they must have, well, they describe the vibrating strings in there, describe the particles of our universe, but it's not just strings. The string theory also has other objects. So strings can be, first of all, closed, like this one, but it can also be open where it has endpoints. But it turns out those endpoints have to live again on other objects. So string theory does not have only strings, it also has two-dimensional objects called brains or even higher dimensionals, which we call d-brains. And actually string theory is a pretty complicated story. If you want to teach it to a, a student, we cannot even do it in half a year or something like this. This takes a lot of time and therefore also the math is quite complicated. Nevertheless, what we have done with this is explain using all of these things this entropy of black holes and also uh, having this new way of thinking about gravity. But I think actually the language of string theory is changing and this is really what I would tell you about. I'm not going to talk about these vibrating strings anymore or the extra dimensions. I'm going to go back to uh, the language of, uh, of information. Um, actually I should first, yeah one thing here actually. Um, one thing we learned also from string theory is that if we describe the physics of these open and closed strings, here you see it a little bit, um, these, these objects have open strings on them and there are objects that have closed strings. These have to do with gravity and these have to do with other forces in nature. And we have obtained one description of string theory where we can realize this holographic principle of, um, of what hoved. So this is a... Uh, world, a, a curved space where there is a boundary which is like this holographic sphere around it where we have only open strings and inside there are these closed strings and here we have gravity living with black holes and then there's some description where we put everything on the boundary and there's an exact way in which the, the gravity in the inside can be described in terms of something on the boundary. We call this a holographic description of space-time. It's a complicated thing, it's a main development for about almost 20 years in string theory, but it shows you a realization of indeed the idea that we can describe everything inside from just describing something on the boundary. And it also describes a gravitational theory in terms of something on the boundary with no gravity. It's as if gravity emerges out of the information on the boundary. This, as I said, is going to be the, the main uh, way we think about string, uh, gravity and even string theory nowadays. So this information on the boundary, you may ask, what is it really? Is it indeed made of strings or whatever, but actually turns out not to be important. It's information like zeros and ones, but of a certain kind. Namely, the quantum mechanics that we have uh, introduced in string theory is very important. So quantum mechanics means that Zeros and ones are not just uh, the, the usual possibilities that we have. In quantum mechanics, there are all kinds of possibilities like spins, uh, which can be up or down and even some combination of it. And this is the idea of quantum information. So I'm going to be quite short here, actually, because it's uh, the, the, well, one of the things discussed in this, this uh, workshop is indeed that we are uh, thinking about information as the basic building blocks, no longer just strings, 
information uh, like zeros and ones or maybe even spin up and spin down which uh, have a quantum uncertainty in them and that's actually what we call quantum information. So I'm gonna uh, actually skip this part. Uh, uh, let me think how to do this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let, let me indeed uh, make clear why quantum information is actually uh, the... Sorry about this. So one of the funny things about uh, quantum mechanics, and this is really where the world uh, changes, uh, view changes when we think about the world classically or quantum mechanically, is that if you look at a particle which is observed, say, on this side of the... Sp of the, of the of the space is where you think about a, an electron, for instance, going to the left, an electron going to the right, and you observe the spins of these particles. One thing that can happen in quantum mechanics, which Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen have described a long time ago, is that when you make the measurement of a spin on one particle, which is not determined a priori, you determine the measurement of the other one. And there is a, a, a relationship between these two, which we call quantum entanglement. And it's that information actually that is carried by black holes. So this idea that black holes have particles and antiparticles across them actually leads to this entanglement. And this is uh, our current understanding of what the information is associated to horizons. So eventually the, the, it's the information that uh, carried by space-time that is the key point to understanding gravity. And the idea that we are working out right now is that Gravity is emergent, not from space-time, being like Einstein described, but from the information contained in the space-time, as if indeed we have to think about space-time as, as containing zeros and ones, qubits, say like written on this uh, sphere. And the gravity laws that we have in, in, in um, the one of our R-squared laws of Newton can, for instance, be described, uh, derived from this uh, picture of having information in space-time. So the new language by which we understand gravity is called emergence. And it's also the new language in which we can understand the, the origin of space and time right from the beginning. So, the, um, yeah, so let me indeed finish with, with what I believe eventually the new story will be about the beginning of space and time. So, Thomas described the Big Bang as the moment in which space and time must have begun, as indeed the moment where the singularity must have happened. And this is where uh, space and time should originate, and then we have this story about the accelerated expansion, inflation which makes the universe go much bigger, and then it even keeps accelerating, and then it contains even dark matter, and this is where we are now. This is the story you heard in the first talk. I think about inflation and actually the whole story that goes about it a little bit like this. This is how the story of the beginning of the universe has been told. It's really like we are thinking about the Big Bang as this moment of creation of the universe, then we seem to have a full story of what's going on right there, but to me it's really what uh, a creation story that we have made as scientists, because I think this story about the beginning of the universe as having this enormous inflation has does something very fundamentally wrong. If you think about space-time as having indeed a beginning where everything is in this one atom, say, of Lemaitre, then the entire universe, which is now observable, has to come out out of this little tiny thing where if you ask how much information is contained in the universe, it's enormous. It is as if you do the following. You have one bit of information, which is the beginning, the single atom, and then suddenly out of this comes 10 to the 100 qubits, 10 to the 100 bits of information out of a single one, and no one tells you where all of this information comes from because it's as if everything comes out of the vacuum. Indeed, this is sometimes said, it's quantum fluctuations from the vacuum that gives us all of these possibilities. Clearly, there's something wrong in the way we keep track of information in our current framework. And why do I think that the story of black, black holes is important for um, uh, the cosmological story? Also in cosmology we have a horizon. When we look outwards to the 
beginning of our universe, we could look back in time, but we actually look also further out. So here we are in the center of our universe and we look outward to say where this early radiation come from, but then the spheres we're looking at are becoming bigger and bigger. And so the model of the universe I'm thinking about is that we are in the center here and we're looking at early radiation, but it's actually a sphere defined here. And eventually there's some distance where we cannot see any further. This is what's called the cosmological horizon. Indeed, in an expanding universe with dark energy, you have a horizon just like we have for uh, black holes. And you can apply all the same reasonings as black holes to these horizons. And then we truly live inside a universe where all the information basically is contained in here. And th that amount of information must be determined by the size of this cosmological horizon. That's the amount of information that's needed to describe everything in the universe. And it cannot be that this all came from a very small part. Actually, if you really believe the current cosmology, all of that seen here came from a region that's smaller than, than uh, a marble or something like that. So our picture of the universe, I think, should be really like this, where we have uh, ourselves in the middle and we have a horizon and then we have even a temperature and an entropy very much like black holes. And we can rederive the laws of gravity using this uh, new way of thinking about emergent gravity. And we find, and I claim, we find a different law of gravity that does exactly this. So the new, the new way of thinking about gravity as an emergent um, phenomena, not in terms of space and time, but really from information, will change the way we think about gravity, not just a little bit. In cosmology, there is a uh, fundamental constant, which is the Hubble constant, which determines even the variations uh, from uh, the, the rotation curves from galaxies. And it's not just a small change in Einstein's equations. Einstein's equations really stop being valid at some point here where uh, the acceleration actually is very small, and so it has nothing to do with high curvature. It's simply that Einstein's equations don't take into account all of that uh, dark energy uh, and all of the information in our universe. And as I said, there's a deviation here that happens very sharply at some point in the observed um, rotation curves. And I claim this variation, this change in the law of gravity, is a phenomenon that we can understand by thinking about gravity in an emergent way, using ideas from string theory. And to me, this actually, by the way, is a, um, a way we can test even the ideas of string theory by explaining uh, this deviation from, from the observed uh, equations. So I think our current model of cosmology, which has this additional dark energy and the additional dark matter, is really not the end of the story. And I think we will have a, a, an exciting uh, time in the, in the in the coming years to think about this uh, different way of thinking about gravity. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thomas, you can also come at the table and so we... Prepare for a few questions that can be asked. So uh, I let them first install themselves. Good, so the word is yours, I think. Uh, well, wait, if you, there's one question there, if you can bring the microphone. 
Good evening. I would like to try to understand because what Professor Hertog told us about dark energy uh, in the beginning and what you, Professor Verlinde, told us afterwards didn't seem to be so compatible to me. I mean, uh, I think Professor Hertog said that there was very little, a very small, small amount of dark energy needed uh, to explain the, the laws. And uh, while, uh, in fact, okay, I think Professor Verlinde explained that the amount of energy that is actually uh, thought to exist in, the, in, in our uh, classical way of thinking would be about 70%. Is there a way to reconcile both? So uh, it's true that when we think about the, the natural um, units in which we can measure energy, then we can use uh, units that only use the Newton's uh, constant and the Planck constant and so on. And then this energy density of the universe is very low. It's, the, it's even the energy density contained in the normal mass is very low, as well as in dark energy as in dark matter. However, if we compare them, the dark energy is actually the largest of the, of the three. But it's just that the, the actual matter density in the universe is very tiny. But this is not a time independent statement. Right now, the dark matter, the dark energy component is dominant and driving the acceleration of the universe. But it has taken 10 billion years for that to be the case. At the early times in the evolution of the universe, it's the normal matter which has dominated or the dark matter which has dominated and the dark energy was irrelevant. The point is that while the matter density decreases as the universe expands, the dark energy density just remains constant. It's a property of, it's a mysterious property of the vacuum, so to speak. So if time goes on, at some point the dark energy becomes relevant and, and, and dominant and, and driving the evolution and that's what we see. I think about this issue very differently. I think we are <laughs> currently understanding the laws of gravity in a different way, where Einstein's equation will be replaced by a different understanding where we can derive it. The statements that we are making now and our understanding of the early cosmology were all based on the assumptions that Einstein's equations remain true, calculating backwards, and that we know the current content of the universe and how they behave. It also makes the assumption that dark matter is a particle and that we can represent the dark energy in a way which is just a very simple way with just one constant in, in the Einstein equation. So there are all kinds of assumptions based are, are needed in the current description and then you indeed have to start with this big bang and then the accelerated inflation to make this all work. I think that story when we understand gravity differently and as an emergent uh, force will um, change drastically. And so I think the current way we think about cosmology has to become out as an approximation from a very different story. I'm quite convinced about that. Just to be clear, I kind of agree with that, but I'm trying for educational purposes to explain the usual story to you. Yeah, but this is like doing the thing that you sort of say to the general public that we know how it works and that we don't really. I think it's telling a story that we say, this is what happened, this is what happened, and this is what happened, and that story is not what we know about cosmology, because it's more like ar archaeology, where you see certain phenomena, things now, and we might sto make a story of what happened in the past. <laughs> That's, I think, what... It's a model, and the model takes us as far as we can get. All right. Go to the next question. Was person a bit? Uh, thank you for the presentation. It's very nice. Uh, I have a small question about the uh, Professor Verlinde. You mentioned that the black hole within it uh, stores the information. Does it mean that our mind it can be manipulated? If some people can manipulate in the yeah, in the black hole because it contains all the information and this, from your figure, it seems that something within will be shown something out. Yeah, I mean the figure about different scope of the views. So, so the current understanding is that, that indeed, if we have a powerful enough way of 
describing, well, using all this information on the, on the boundary of our space, we could in principle do everything with everything what's inside. But this is not something that's very practical and it doesn't have to worry uh, as in our daily lives. And, but it's true that, that if, if we believe the laws of gravity and, and the, way, the things we learn from them, then all the information necessary to describe anything inside a certain volume can be sort of mapped onto its boundary. There's a question behind you, there, yeah, to the left. Yeah. Hi. Um, of all forces, gravity is usually considered pretty weak. Um, are you challenging that with this theory? I mean, you, you talked about the light bending, and that's due to the information that's in space-time, um, and that the observable curvature is not what was predicted. So is gravity stronger in, in the theory that you're proposing? So uh, n not in, in our, our uh, solar system. I mean, of course, Newton wrote down a, a force law which works very well in many circumstances. Where it, gravity is stronger is at cosmological scales like in galaxies and so on where Newton would predict, a, or Einstein would predict a smaller force, we see indeed that there's more attraction there, but it doesn't make it into a strong force because, I mean, those forces are still very, very tiny compared to any other force in nature. It, but anyway, the, the weakness of gravity is mostly important for us at, at uh, tiny, for tiny objects where we have uh, these other forces which are more important. When we go to very large scale, actually gra gravity is the dominant force because all the other forces basically cancel out. And so galaxies and so are they are dominated by gravity. And we can almost forget about uh, electromagnetism and all those other forces. Uh, maybe the, the left, well, my left. Uh, Professor Hector, Professor Verlinder, thank you very much for uh, wonderful lectures. I'm not an exact scientist, so maybe my question comes from a lack of understanding of what you said. But Professor Hector, you, I think, started by saying that string theory explains the fundamental state of matter as such. But later on in your presentation, you said that string theory does not assume space-time because space-time can collapse, and therefore it is more fundamental than space-time. But how then does string theory build space-time, or how does space-time result from strings? Because that I don't understand, sorry. Yeah, so the central idea which uh, Eric then developed about how you could begin to formulate the theory of physics without assuming space and time, is built around the notion of holography. As Eric explained, holography in this context means that you envision a theory without gravity on, on, the, on the horizon, on a boundary surface, the horizon of a black hole or the horizon in cosmology, as the fundamental theory, the fundamental degrees of freedom, the building blocks of nature. And that what we perceive as space and time, in that case, inside the universe, inside our horizon or outside black holes, is really emergent under certain circumstances from those fundamental theory that is defined, so to speak, on the boundary without reference to any notion of the usual space and time. So I didn't develop this in my lecture because I left it uh, to Eric to develop this, but um, that is indeed, as Eric explained, the dominant line of research um, in what I would say string theory nowadays. This is different from Plato's cave, for instance, where you you project onto a three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional wall. 
evidently you used to think, well, then you're going to surely you're not going to lose some information. But the most powerful aspect of holography in string theory, as, it, as, it's, as it's manifest in string theory, is that it's a precise map. In fact, it, without losing any information, it's an exact equivalence. So it's a map from the usual physics of Einstein, in which space and time are central, to an entirely different mathematical model which makes no reference to space and time. That's the idea of holography, which is being developed um, as we speak, so to speak. Okay, uh, there's someone there. Hi, um, I have a question uh, regarding the nature of time. So um, we have these two views, uh, I think brought by uh, quantum mechanics and quantum theory of uh, viewing space uh, in terms of particles and in terms of waves. Now, um, since uh, the theory of Einstein shows that uh, both space and time are entangled, um, can we view time also in uh, some sort of discrete way? Or should we look at it in a continuous way? And maybe um, to elaborate on it, the string tree uh, provides some way to uh, uh, combine both views in a, in a um, yeah, more general uh, view to look at this um, time nature. I think actually um, we have not a full understanding of what time, how to describe it in any other way. I mean, we have these models where we can construct one space dimension where we say indeed things live on the boundary and then we have one sp dimension missing which is sort of the, 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 the emergent space dimension. But emergent time I think is still uh, not well understood but it's true that we, we actually think that even time must have eventually another explanation of why, where it comes from. Whether it's discrete, I think that's sort of a very simple answer for it, but I think we, we simply have no full understanding there yet. But that it is emergent from something and therefore the continuous time as we now use it in our present uh, even physics equations, I don't think will be the, the final way we understand what time is. Okay, maybe here question in front. Thank you. Um, when you talked about the shapes of the extra dimensions, you seem to mean rather um, local property like curvature. Uh, what is it precisely that you mean and how do you suggest that we probe it? Um, good question. Uh, so the well, yeah, <laughs> you probe it indirectly by the kinds of particles and the masses and the forces that you observe in the three large dimensions of space. Uh, I don't think anytime soon we're going to probe it, probe these extra dimensions directly and. Well, it's assumed that these extra dimensions are very tiny, so there's no way that we can really see them. Uh, there has been some theories that were proposed where we might use very high energy accelerators to maybe see them, but they're now already being ruled out by the current experiment. So I don't think that, as you say, that there's a very realistic chance that we can probe the extra dimensions. It, the only way is by indirect looking at what the effect of it is, how it influences the spectrum of particles and the interactions that we see. A direct probing of extra dimensions has to go through gravity only, right? It's only the structure of space-time, gravitational, gravi gravity that sort of enters them. Well, the geometry and the topology, sure. B both. Okay, our last question. Yeah. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, is from the experimental point of view, uh, to, what, to what extent the information that is 
that we analyzed to put up these theories only relies on our perception of radiation or information that coming from outside, from, from the cosmos. It's only our detection of light and radiation. Is there a chance that there is something else that we are not able to detect and would add, I mean, some extra uh, event that would happen that we are not able to detect and then there is information there that can make things easier to explain or Yes, there is a missing? source, yes. Uh, and it's called gravitational waves, for instance. So far, all we know about the universe has reached us, as you say, through light particles. That's all we know. But Einstein's theory also predicts that changes in mass configurations will propagate in the fabric of space-time itself. And that's what he called gravitational waves. Gravitational waves are ripples, waves, of the fabric of space itself. And they're also reaching us from all sides in the universe. When two of these black holes that Eric describes collide, that will change the structure of space-time, and those changes will propagate through the fabric. But gravity is weak, as we just discussed. So the gravitational waves are generally, when they reach Earth, they're very weak. But there's a huge effort worldwide on, on, on the way to actually, finally, directly detect those gravitational waves. 